Hi, welcome to One God, One Church, a place where you can build a, relation, a better relationship with the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In case you haven't checked us, us out before, we just want to say welcome. Welcome to those locally here in Ontario. Welcome to wherever you are watching. And we certainly appreciate you taking a moment to watch our service and our sermon, and we hope it helps you um, have a better desire for One God, One Church. And we don't mean this specific institution. We mean One God under, over One Church. Heard something the other day um, by a pastor, 2,500 denominations, Christian denominations. That is a lot of difference. A lot of difference and really they should all just be based on this the Bible one thing and everybody has their own interpretation unfortunately so um, we just pray that one day we can all come together as one and our service is a traditional mass service we follow the ancient church the ancient fathers from the time around Christ it's documented some people call it the Catholic Mass, Catholic meaning universal. We're not endorsing a Catholic church. We're not trying to be heretical. Um, you know, we have disagreement with all philosophies. Um, not all, but probably many in some way or another. And we just, just believe in the Bible. It's God's word. And speaking of that, and someone that believed in the Bible, this past Thursday, February 21st, was uh, the one-year anniversary of the passing, the going to heaven of Billy Graham. And Karen and I watched the, um, a replay of that service, and we still cried. It, it is amazing. He is an amazing man. But when you hear about his life, and if you look into his life, and um, Decision Magazine, if you get Decision Magazine, the Billy Graham Evangelical Association, and you read the articles and you read the excerpts from Billy Graham. I've said it before, he preached fire and brimstone. He preached heaven and hell. He wasn't all fluffy. He knows if you're a sinner and you don't repent of your sins, you're going to hell. He knew that, he preached that. And I sometimes wonder if he was, you know, for such a time as this, he was in the right place at the right time, God had him during our time for a reason. If he was up and coming today, who knows if he would make it because the church is so soft on so many biblical issues these days. Anyway, just want to take a minute and say we honor the fact that Billy Graham was such a great preacher, okay? So as part of our service, since we do a traditional format for our, for our Mass, we have an opening prayer, but what's important besides the prayer and the homily or sermon is this the Eucharist if you tuned into our last sermon or you were here for our last sermon you know the importance of the Eucharist the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Savior and we're not saying anything other than this is the Eucharist we ask God to make it his body his blood we ask Jesus to come into our hearts through this bread and through this wine mixed with water. And then we just meditate on it. We take it and we believe it is him entering us. And if you do that, you will feel a renewal. I guarantee it. Okay? So before I get started, I do want to have I do want to make an announcement. I want you to check out our website. Um, things are changing all the time. So if you go to our resources page, there are things on there. Karen's page, my lovely sweetheart Karen, posted another addition to her Karen's page, and you should check it out. It's really, really good. Um, you, will, you will definitely like it if you take the time to go to Karen's page and read the two things now that she has posted, okay? And we start our service by what our mission is, which is 1 Corinthians 1.10, okay? Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. 
Amen to that. So we will have an opening prayer. Then we'll have our readings. We'll have a sermon. We'll have the Eucharist. We'll have a closing prayer. And I like this prayer. I said it last time. Um, it's a prayer Karen wrote. I really, really like it. It says, Dear Lord, you are Lord over our lives. We honor your holy name, Lord Jesus. There is power in your name, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Isn't that true? We honor the power of your sacrificial blood on the cross. We truly know your honor, grace, mercy, love, forgiveness, patience, and kindness. We submit our lives to you in servitude, and we should all be doing that. We ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in our service to you as a son and daughter in our church, one God, one church. We also thank you for our blessings. They are numerous and they truly are. If you stop and think, we are so fortunate, we are so blessed to live where we live in this great country called the United States of America. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Philippians 4:13. Lord Christ, you are Lord over everything, and he certainly is, and it's best that you make him Lord over your life, and then after you do that, pursue it. Change your heart, change your ways, work to, toward changing them. It doesn't happen overnight, it's constant. We ask that you bless our finances and our debts. Help us to give to you as you give to us, your promise redeemed. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. Hallelujah, amen, and so it is. So that is our prayer, okay? All right, now our readings for the day. We're actually taking our readings <clears throat> from Gospels, so there isn't a reading from somewhere else, all right? And you'll see why. Our first reading, <clears throat> excuse me, is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 28 to 55. Yes, another long one. <laughs> In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Mary saw, and Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, 
all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. That is the end of the first reading. And we say thanks be to God. Now, Alleluia, 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 our gospel. And our gospel today is according to John chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Alleluia. And we say, on our minds, on our lips, and on our hearts. Right? Because they have Jesus' words in them. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Women, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come, Jesus replied. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. The Gospel of the Lord. And we say in reply, Thanks be to God. So, we all know the rest of that story, right? Jesus listened to his mother and turned the water into wine. Even though he said he wasn't ready, his mother asked him to do something. He obeyed Mary, his earthly mother. Right? So, think about that. Jesus, the Savior of the world, obeying his mother. One of the commandments, right? Honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus most likely kept that commandment even though he was God. At least, that's my opinion. So, two sermons ago I talked about the importance of the Lord's Prayer. The last time I talked about the importance of the Eucharist. And today I'm going to talk about the importance of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Many people seem to be afraid of Mary. The non-Catholic community, especially the evangelical community, puts down those that venerate Mary. You know, Karen and I watched a Mass the other day, and the sermon that the, the priest talked about when he was 10 years old, and the only Catholic in a small town, and when he, was, he grew up in the South, in Georgia, and one of the Baptist kids asked him, you know, why do you guys worship Mary and pray to statues? You know, that's, the, the guy was like my age, so that's 50, 50 years ago. That attitude toward the Catholics by the Baptists, the Evangelicals, the Protestants, I don't think it's changed. Anyway, it's a false statement to say Catholics worship Mary. Anyone telling you that does not know the Catholic faith. I believe Mary has a special place in heaven and should also have one in our hearts. I think she should be venerated, and Jesus himself is the one who set the example for us to follow. Why do you think God himself listened to a mere mortal? Could it have been out of gratitude for her obedience and what Mary went through to carry the Savior of the world? Think about it. For nine months, she carried him. So she not only carried him, she nursed him, she cleaned him, she changed him, she taught him, she raised him, she loved him. Think about all that she went through. So if you celebrate Christmas, which I'm sure you do if you're watching this, and I hope you do, 
and you listen to Christmas carols during the Christmas season, there's one that I think you should play and meditate. It doesn't get a lot of airplay on the radio for some reason, but you can easily download it. As a matter of fact, I think, like right now, I'm going to read the words to the song. I think you can listen to it anytime and meditate on it. And uh, that song is Amy Grant's Breath of Heaven. This song, in my opinion, captures what Mary went through. So please listen to the words as I read them. I'm not going to sing them because you'll run away, you'll shut the, you'll shut the video off. <laughs> but I want them, I want you to listen to them. I want you to take them in. I want them to sink into your heart. I want you to picture what Mary must have felt like and what she went through. So here goes. I have traveled many moonless nights, cold and weary with a babe inside, and I wonder what I've done, Holy Father, you have come, and chosen me now to carry your son. I am waiting in a silent prayer. I am frightened by the load I bear. In a world as cold as stone, must I walk this path alone? Be with me now, be with me now. Breath of heaven, hold me together. Be forever near me, breath of heaven. Lighten my darkness, pour over me your holiness, for you are holy, breath of heaven. Do you wonder as you watch my face if a wiser one should have had my place, but I offer all I am for the mercy of your plan. Help me be strong, help me be, help me. Breath of heaven, hold me together, be forever near me, breath of heaven. Lighten my darkness, pour over me your holiness, for you are holy, breath of heaven. Hold me together, be forever near me, breath of heaven. Lighten my darkness, pour over me your holiness, for you are holy, breath of heaven. I mean, think about that. Think of those words. I mean, think if Mary is thinking those things. Unreal. Anyway, to me, we have been so numbed by Satan's control over this world, we actually today think nothing of seeing a woman who is young, unmarried, and pregnant. As a matter of fact, it's celebrated. It's celebrated by many. And actually, it wasn't that long ago when it was considered shameful. I know if you're around my age, and you grew up in the 50s or 60s, you know if someone was unmarried, young, and pregnant, it was shameful. It wasn't something that they went around and yay, yay, rejoice, and Hollywood and the media plays it up like it's some great thing. Yes, life is a great thing, but there is such a thing as marriage and family. And God created the intimacy between man and woman for marriage. So. Do you realize Mary could have been stoned to death for this? Knowing what her faith could, fate could be, her faith led her to say, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. Since I'm quoting from our earlier readings, let's continue with the words from the Bible. As Billy Graham used to say, the Bible says, right? So let's go with different uh, statements from the readings I said today, I read. First, blessed are you among women. Next, blessed is she who has believed that the, that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. Billy Graham, like all Christians, believed, like all Christians believe, Billy Graham believed the Bible is true. And if so, 
why don't all generations call Mary bless? So, it's something to think about. When you read it in the Bible, but yet everybody's afraid. Oh, we're praying to Mary when we have Jesus. Mary is an intercessor. Paul himself talked about intercessory prayer a lot. There's nothing wrong with intercessory prayer. There's nothing wrong with going to Mary and asking her to pray to Jesus for you. And another point I'd like to touch on is the subject of the Marian apparitions or appearances. I mean, if you take the time to look these up, to watch some of these, I don't know how you cannot believe the power of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I mean, she has appeared to so many and so many times throughout history. Everyone should know the famous ones, like this, the miracle of Fatima, right? Karen and I have this movie, we watch it, it's great. Then you have Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, we have a video posted on our resources page, you can watch that. And if you watch these things and just think about them and take the time to think and meditate and really take in what is going on, you will see the Blessed Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary should be taken seriously, right? So besides that one and Our Lady of Guadalupe, you have Our Lady of Lourdes. Um, <clears throat> so if you remember that, that's Bernadette Subrius. She was a 14-year-old peasant child, and she um, she had a Marian visions at a, and dug a spring which healed many people and it's proven, it's documented. It's like this, the three little children in this movie, they were threatened to be boiled in oil if they would just say it didn't happen. They didn't think about that, just like the apostles. And these three little children prayed the rosary a lot. And the oldest, Lucia, became Sister Lucia. She became a nun. She lived to be 93 years old. She wrote her memoirs, The Three Secrets of Fatima. I mean, one of those revelations that the Blessed Virgin gave them at Fatima was one of Satan's greatest attacks is going to be against the, the family unit, against marriage and the family. Think about that. Think about marriage today and the push for anything other than marriage between a man and a woman. Think about abortion, the killing of human life. We talk about like we're such a compassionate, compassionate country, but yet we think nothing. Oh, it's my body? No, but it's, your, it's someone else's life inside you. You don't have the right to take that life. And that's a subject for another day, right? So I can go on and on and talk about there are a lot of Marian visions. You could actually just Google it and even look at Wikipedia, as liberal as it is. They talk about a lot of them. So anyway, I was also, I mentioned the rosary, the three children, how much they prayed the rosary. My mom taught me the rosary, and I am thankful to her. God rest her soul. I pray the rosary. It's a powerful, powerful prayer. And you're not praying and I'm worshiping Mary in it. And I was going to talk more about the rosary, but I believe I could probably do a whole sermon on it. So I'm going to get to the next part of this so we can conclude. So I guess what I'm trying to do is really tell you Mary is worth being venerated, right? And rather than continue with a bunch of other facts or my own words, I'm going to read you excerpts from the book Mary for Evangelicals by Tim Perry. And these excer excerpts were taken from an interview that he did with Pat Robertson's Christian Broadcasting Network, CBN, which means, leads me to ask, because Karen and I watch the 700 Club, hey Pat, why aren't you talking more about our Blessed Virgin? So, here goes, Mary for Evangelicals couple of questions from the interview. So CBN.com to Tim Perry. 
Why do you think there is such a current fascination with Mary? First, we must consider the impact of what Timothy George has called the ecumenism, ecumenism of the trenches. Over the last 35 years or so, evangelicals and Catholics have slowly come to appreciate how much we share in terms of morality, particularly in the thorny ethical problems surrounding the beginning and end of life, the definition of marriage, there we go, <clears throat> and the constructive role faith can play and should play in the public realm. I think this has led to the establishment of grassroots friendships based on trust. To put the matter bluntly, theological disagreement takes on a whole new tone when you're standing outside an abortion clinic and praying together. And you know who's big on that? The March for Life? That's Catholic. That's the Catholic Church, right? So now, as evangelicals and Protestants and <clears throat> Lutherans all gather, and they know how important it is to end abortion, especially with this political climate today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as they pray together, they get to talk. And those people, once they get to know people that go to the Catholic Mass and uh, pray, to, pray for intercession through Mary or saints, they realize that these people aren't bad. And they're not going to hell. They know who Jesus is. So, anyway, <clears throat> to go on from uh, Tim, he says, leaders like Timothy George, J.I. Packer, and Chuck Colson have used that trust wisely to engage in theological dialogue with Catholic theologians and leaders. <clears throat> Once such theological ties were established, it was only a matter of time before Mary came up. Since the third generation of Reformation, Mary has personified every major doctrinal dispute. Think about that. Second, in the evangelical community, Growing numbers of theologians have begun to return to the sources of the early church fathers. Like I said, we this, this mass format, you go back. You could trace it back to the right after Jesus. They were celebrating mass in the homes or in a place. And I've mentioned it before, St. Justin the Martyr, when I talked last time about the Eucharist. You can look it up. It's documented. And it's documented by many church early church leaders and fathers as they're called, the ancient ones, back from the, you know, 50 to 150 A.D. They have writings, they prove the Mass, right? So, as they go back to the early church fathers, they, he says, Tim, you can't go back and read what they've written without reading about Mary. Think about that. Someone seriously reading the early church fathers is soon to be made aware that the medieval theologians of Western Europe didn't invent Mariology, which is what is usually alleged by evangelical Protestants. So think about it. They're thinking, oh, it was the 12, 1300s when all of a sudden Mary popped up. Nope. The early church fathers talked about her. I mean, she was with Jesus through his life. She raised him. She bore him. She gave birth to him. She raised him. And if you look, she was with him throughout his ministry. She was there when he died. She was there when he came back from the dead. Right? So, <clears throat> third, the, exam the remarkable papacy of John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, brought Mary to the global stage. Here was a man who was, as a Polish Catholic, <laughs> passionately devoted to Mary in ways that North American evangelical Protestants would find difficult to accept. Think of the M on his papal shield, or his personal motto, totus tuus, which is an expression of devotion to Mary. And here was a man who built bridges in all kinds of ways to evangelicals. It was Pope John Paul II that welcomed Billy Graham into St. Anne's Church, the largest Catholic church in Krakow, so Billy Graham could preach there. Think about that one. Pope John Paul II was convinced Mary ought not to be a symbol of division, 
but an opportunity for ecumenical dialogue, not only with orthodoxy, but with the churches of the Reformation. Some of the current interest in Mary has come down to the spreading of this vision. Fourth, I think our culture's general interest in spirituality contributes to this fascination. Perhaps we could call this the Dan Brown factor, though it is clearly much older than the Da Vinci Code. It has encouraged believers and non-believers alike to dig into the historical source, sources of the Christian faith. And while some of it has produced voodoo scholarship, quote unquote, that lies, which lies behind Brown's novel, some of it has led to more serious explorations. And, again, you can't examine early Christianity and not see the interest in the Blessed Virgin Mary from the church's beginning. Wow. Think about that. So, the next question from CBN. Why did you decide to explore Mary specifically for evangelicals? <clears throat> Excuse me, Tim's response. Primarily because that is how I identify myself. As an evangelical Protestant, I know on the one hand how suspicious we can be of Catholicism in general and the Marian doctrine and devotion in particular. And if I didn't know it before I began my project, I certainly have been made well aware of it since. Like I said, it hasn't changed in 50 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway. The Reformation is five centuries past, but when it comes to conversations about Mary, sometimes it's felt, it felt to me like it just happened yesterday. On the other hand, I also know how deeply traditional our movement is when it comes to Jesus. Our traditionalism with respect to Jesus is not simply theological. It is also devotional. We have a traditional Christology because we are convinced that in our experience of Jesus, we experience God. I see a disjuncture there that needs to be addressed. If we're serious about keeping Christology, and more specifically, a high doctrine of incarnation as one of our core beliefs, we need to think very carefully about Mary. Mary was chosen, listen to this, Mary was chosen to be the container of the uncontainable God. Think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. If we are serious about cultivating a piety that is centered on the experience of the living Christ through the Holy Spirit, we need to think carefully about Mary. Only Mary is presented in the Gospels of both Luke and John as the model, model disciple of corporate faith. Evangelicals, for their own sake, can and should recover some of that language. Not to add to what we believe, but to deepen it. So if in doing so, bridges are built to other Christian communities, that's a bonus. Side note, I think what Tim is saying here, one God, one church, right? Bridges built to other Christian communities. I keep saying it. Jesus, doesn't, as our bridegroom, doesn't want to marry 2,500 brides. He wants one. <clears throat> the last question, excuse me. Why do you say that after writing this book, Mary is even more mysterious to you now than before? Tim's answer. I spent several hundred pages working through biblical material and the history of theological thought about this woman. And I feel as though I have yet to even scratch the surface. The reason is straightforward. The mystery in which Mary is shrouded is the mystery of the Incarnation. And that's a mystery in the deepest sense of the word. It's not a puzzle to be solved. It's not a complicated concept to be grasped. It's a person to be worshipped. And that person, that mystery, is Jesus. Mary remains mysterious for me because she refuses to remain the object of my study. She always leads me to Jesus in terms of doctrine. My work on Mary has deepened my understanding of the Incarnation, and she leads me to Jesus in terms of devotion. 
as I have come to bless Mary, as the scriptures say I should, I have come to find love for I have come to find my love for Jesus has strengthened and even reawakened. Mary steps aside in order that I might not dwell on her, whether in my head or heart, but on her son. So I think this says it all. Think about it. What Tim is saying. He says, Mary always leads him to Jesus. The rosary points to Jesus. These movies point to Jesus. Everything about Mary. She should be venerated. She shouldn't be someone you're afraid of or put down. Or yes, she had a purpose and, and then that was it. No. Jesus obeyed her, even though he, he wasn't ready to do anything yet, to start his ministry of love for his mother. Think about it. So I highly encourage you to pick up Tim Perry's book and read it. If you're curious about what he's talking about, and, I, and when I actually, Karen is the one, I shouldn't say I, Karen is the one that found this this book and it's a wonderful book but afterwards I looked it up on Google and you can there are a lot of evangelicals talking about Mary so <clears throat> in conclusion right <clears throat> at the cross Jesus gave us Mary gave, gave Mary to us as our heavenly mother Mary was an advocate for Jesus she was there for again his birth his ministry, his death, his resurrection. So if Jesus allowed her to be his advocate, isn't it time Mary became your advocate too? That was a long one, wasn't it? <laughs> but uh, it's on my heart, so I'm going to say what's on my heart. I don't know what else to do. Okay? So thank you for your patience on that one. Okay? Now we're going to um, start the Eucharistic prayer, all right? So pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And then we all say here and wherever you are, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy indeed, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon the dewfall, upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. And giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the cup, and once more, giving thanks to his Father in heaven, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this in memory of me therefore as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection we offer you Lord the bread of life and the cup of salvation giving thanks that you held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that by partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. So let us pray in gratitude for this meal, for these people, as we give ourselves to you. So let us now say the prayer Jesus himself taught us to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. So deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And at this time, we give each other, as I talked about the Eucharist last time, right? The sign of peace. Back in the early, early days, when they were first doing this, the kiss of peace. So we just turn to whoever is next to us, and we say... We wish them peace. We can give them a kiss, a handshake. I always blow one to my sweetheart. Peace, my love. Right? So, Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And grace, graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who will live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Okay. Our communion prayer. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And we say, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Now we can take communion. body of Christ. just thank you for this and folks I pray that you are taking this seriously that you feel the warmth of the Holy Spirit entering into you to renew you and set you on a straighter path so our final blessing so having tasted your goodness Lord send us out as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace as you go out to serve him and each other. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and each other. Amen. Thank you.